Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landa. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about Cipro or Ciprofloxin. It's an antibiotic approved by the Food and Drug Administration 1987 off patent in 2004, which means that cheaper generic alternatives are available. The drug is a second generation fluoroquinolone. It's a broad spectrum antibiotic on the World Health Organization list of essential medications. Antibiotics are very frequently prescribed for viral infections. They don't work for viral infections. If you have a common cold, if you have an acute upper respiratory tract infection, not going to work. Shouldn't take these kind of medicines. They're widely used. By 2002, the fluoroquinolone family was the most commonly used class of antibiotics in the country, and Cipro in 2010 became the most widely used of all the fluoroquinolones. It's actually the third most commonly used antibiotic in the United States just after amoxicillin and azithromycin. There are 32 million prescriptions written each year for this drug, but remember it's only for bacterial infections. It's not for the common cold, and unfortunately because of the overuse, there's a lot of bacterial resistance. So now it's not even much good for acute sinusitis or lower respiratory tract infections or even uncomplicated gonorrhea. Now, the Food and Drug Administration says the indications are for those people over age 18 who suffer from susceptible bacterial infections, susceptible bacterial infections of the skin or soft tissues, the bone or the joint, maybe have infectious diarrhea, maybe they have an intra-abdominal infection, or typhoid fever, or even they've been exposed to inhalation anthrax, or people who have chronic bacterial prostatitis, but that's an uncommon condition. More common is chronic prostatitis without bacteria, much more common. And that doesn't have a chance of improving with this drug. And now, unfortunately, even though the FDA says it's good for lower respiratory tract infections and acute sinusitis and upper uh, and, and gonorrhea and, and urinary tract infections, unfortunately, the benefits of the drug are markedly diminished. Well, the Infectious Disease Society of America says, well, it could be used for acute or bacterial prostatitis due to bacteria or acute pyelonephritis, kidney infection, or complicated hospital urinary tract infections, but only if the regular antibiotics drugs like Bactrim or Septra or Nitrofurantoin don't seem to work, could be used for certain skin infections or prosthetic joint infections, or even sometimes community-acquired abdominal infections, but the drug is obsolete basically for gonorrhea because of all of the resistance that's been engendered and it only has modest activity now against strep pneumonia, so it's not very good when we begin a course of therapy for a lower respiratory infection. Fortunately, it seems that the drug has a good concentration in the urinary tract, so in the prostate. It also seems to be active and concentrated somewhat in saliva and the nasal and the bronchial secretions and the sinuses and in the skin. 50 to 70 percent of the drug is going to go out in the urine is unmetabolized drug. That's why it's so good for the prostate. 10 percent is going to go out as metabolites. The dose of the drug can be anywhere between 250 and 750 milligrams typically every 12 hours depending on the particular underlying type and severity of infection typically given for anywhere between five days and 14 days, but for instance, if a person's been exposed to anthrax, inhalation anthrax, the dose is up to 60 days. Well, in people who are elderly who don't have good kidney function, the dose has to be reduced, and we know that people who take the drug should consume a significant amount of liquid so that the urine flows freely because the drug can crystallize in the urinary tract, especially if you have an acidic type urine. 
Well, if you're going to take the drug, you should take it either two hours before or a long time after you've taken some sort of an antacid with aluminum or magnesium because that could decrease the concentration by about 90%. You shouldn't take it with sucralfate. And if you're going to take it, well, stay away from dairy or calcium-fortified foods that are going to decrease the concentration in the system by about 40%. Same goes for zinc or for iron. Side effects are, well, as with any antibiotic, could get some nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or a rash. But more importantly, there could be some phototoxicity, could make you sensitive to the sun, could impair the liver function, or could cause a peripheral neuropathy, cause the nerves not to work right. So you have some pain, some burning, some tingness, some numbling, or weakness of the digits. And that could lead to a change in the touch or the temperature or the pain sensation. Sometimes people can get a hypersensitivity reaction to the medicine. Killing all the so-called good bacteria might allow a particularly bad bacteria and its toxin to grow called Clostridium difficile could cause a major type of diarrhea, can cause some sort of arrhythmias in certain individuals, lowers the threshold for seizures, causes headache and dizziness and insomnia in some people. But the common side effects might include the central nervous system. And when the central nervous system is involved, people complain of nervousness and agitation and anxiety and nightmares and paranoia, and they have dizziness and confusion and tremors and even hallucinations and depressions and psychotic reactions. And some go on to self-injury. Now, most of the time, side effects from the drug are mild to moderate, and they get better after you discontinue the drug, but some of them can become permanent. And now there's a condition known as being floxed. In 2016, the Food and Drug Administration accepted the existence of this so-called potentially permanent syndrome that's called fluoroquinolone-associated disability. And because of that, the Food and Drug Administration now recommends that you reserve this antibiotic or antibiotics in the family for severe infections that aren't otherwise treatable. That was in 2016 here in the United States. Health Canada, which is the Canadian equivalent, in 2017 said the same thing. And it was in October of 2018 that the European Medicine Association, which is basically the FDA for the entire European Union, said the same thing. So this fluoroquinolone-associated disability, it's recognized as a syndrome, and it seems that people can end up with long-term disabling and potentially irreversible complications, perhaps because the mitochondria inside the cells bear certain resemblance to their bacterial ancestors, and the antibiotics might actually pose a threat to the mitochondria or the DNA in the mitochondria. Another theory is that it might have something to do with binding iron, and then when it binds iron, it prevents certain enzymes from working. About 50% of the people who have the condition end up with some memory loss or panic or depression. Well, a significant problem. As a matter of fact, the label on the drug has changed 20 times over the past four or five years, finally leading to some decrease in our fascination with the drug and a decrease in the use. So among the risks, they have a black box warning. The black box warning suggests that people who take the drug might be at increased risk for tendinitis or tendon rupture, even if you're otherwise healthy, but especially if you're over age 60, if you're taking prednisone, if you're involved in strenuous physical activity, if you have any degree of renal compromise, or if you've had a transplant. It's thought that maybe that's because the drug works on a key enzyme that breaks down some of the tissue that surrounds the actual muscle cells themselves. There also is a black box warning that warns of peripheral neuropathy and the central nervous system effects. And it says that if you have myasthenia gravis, you shouldn't take the drug. And it also says that you should use the drug only if there is no alternative treatment, especially if you have an acute exacerbation of chronic bronchitis or sinusitis or uncomplicated cystitis. This drug probably isn't appropriate and for children 
it probably should only be used for those individuals who have exposure to inhalation type anthrax. It's not the go-to drug, as it's frequently used, for uncomplicated urinary tract infections. You should stay away from the drug if you're a pregnant woman. Well, there have not been really adequate studies, but we do know that it doesn't seem to cause too much problem, but is that good enough reason to take this over a different medicine? Probably not. Breastfeeding, you have to be a little bit careful because it will get into the breast milk and it's thought that it may damage the articular cartilage of newborn. So again, it's not the first choice and it interacts with the medicines that you might be taking to reduce your sugar if you happen to be a diabetic, so you've got to be careful. The drug works by interfering with bacterial enzymes known as topoisomerases, type 2 or type 4. These, uh, these are called also uh, gyrases, DNA gyrases. And they're important because they work on the bacterial DNA and allow it to replicate itself and to transcribe it and to repair damage to it and to recombine it because it works on untangling knots and opening up the DNA chains so that the DNA can be replicated. Well, it's important to realize that in the 1980s, the researchers working on the fluoroquinolones found, or working on the quinolones, found that they could add a fluoride ion and increase the potency of the drug, increase its penetration into the central nervous system. Now, not all of fluoroquinolones have met with success, and some of them have had to be taken off the market because of increased toxicity. There was one, even as late as 1999, that was drawn, withdrawn from the market because of liver toxicity. Bacterial resistance is getting to be more and more of a common problem, and a lot of the bacteria that the medicine was once used to treat, now they don't seem to have any effect. And it's because of change in the bacterial DNA gyrase, those topoisomerases, or a change in the ability of the cell to get rid of or push out the antibiotic, or a decrease in the permeability of the membrane of the cell, so that the antibiotic can't even get in in the first place. Contraindicated. Children shouldn't really take the drug. Pregnant women, probably best not. Nursing women, definitely. If you have epilepsy or seizure disorder, probably the drug isn't for you. It can change the metabolism of other kind of drugs. It increases the concentration of Cymbalta or Duloxetine by about two and a half fold. If you're taking a muscle relaxant known as Xanaflex, it's going to increase the concentration of it by about six fold. Interestingly, it increases the concentration of Viagra in the system about two fold between the 1980s and 2015, the Food and Drug Administration received more than 60,000 reports of adverse reactions to the drug, including about 6,500 deaths. Now, that's the fluoroquinolones. They can't necessarily say there's cause and effect. It's just somehow people were taking it and suffered those kind of reactions. Was it the antibiotic or not? But we do know that Cipro is one of those drugs that seems to be associated with the greatest incidence of side effects. So let's just review some of the complications. In 2008, we found out that it could cause ruptured tendon. In 2011, we found that it worsened myasthenia gravis. Then in 2013, it caused peripheral neuropathies. In 2016, there was more problem about the problems associated with not only the tendons, but the muscles and the joints and the nerves and the central nervous system. In 2018, more about the mental health side effects of the drug, impaired attention, and agitation, and memory problems, disorientation, delirium, hypoglycemia, low blood sugar. 2018, we also found that it might be associated with an increased incidence of aortic dissections, aortic aneurysms, especially in the elderly or in people who have high blood pressure. Well, drug has to be used for appropriate indications for bacterial infections 
And if it is, then the drug might be appropriate. The drug certainly has gotten a lot less expensive over the period of time. Now it can be purchased as a generic with a coupon that you can get from GoodRx just on the web. You can have uh, supply for anywhere between $5 and $16 if you want to get the brand name. A uh, dose is still going to cost about $120. So the bottom line is if you have an infection, if you have a bacterial infection, if you have a bacterial infection that can't be more adequately treated by other drugs, then Cipro might be a drug to consider. But remember, when it came out in the first place, 1987, seemed like it was a simple drug, seemed to work on a whole lot of bacteria. Now it's progressively less effective because of overuse, and not only is it progressively less effective, but half of the time it's prescribed for people who don't even have an infection for which it can provide any benefit, and over the period of time, from 1987 till now, the Food and Drug Administration has had to keep adding side effects to the indications or to the drug because of all of the things we're learning about it. So remember, just, just be careful with the antibiotics. Be informed. Thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.